Welcome to an enlightening podcast from IslamPodcasts.com. We encourage our listeners to please comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please remind your family and friends to also visit IslamPodcasts.com for engaging discussions. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحد العقدة من يسميني ثاني يفقه قولي عنا بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى سيد القرآن يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أو you believe fear Allah as he should be feared and don't die except in the state of being Muslims and he says in the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the hadith a famous hadith narrated in the book of Sahih Muslim بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود كما بدأ that the hadith says that Islam started strange and it'll return the same way it started being strange so give glad tidings to the strangers or good news to the strangers so the hadith has a few meanings but the central meaning and the central explanation of the hadith is that Islam started off as something unique as something strange, as something different, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this message to the Prophet sallallahu and then it'll come back to being viewed as strange and different and unique. So give glad tidings to those people who adhere to Islam, who consider themselves as strangers, who adhere to this message even when the entire society and the entire world around you looks at it as being strange. And I thought about this hadith this morning because today is November 1st and just yesterday we had October 31st, which is Halloween and we know about the origins of Halloween and if we don't, it's good to go read it to go look into it, where it came from how it came about what its background is but I was talking to my wife about why we don't compromise on the issue of Halloween why our kids don't participate in Halloween and how we need to communicate that to other families, whether they're Muslim families or whether they're non-Muslim families in the school when they're invited to events and to social gatherings and things like that, and how we as a couple, as a husband and wife, need to address this issue, not only to these other families, but with our kids also. And I thought about this hadith, because we know they'd always talk about, ever since I was a kid growing up, this concept of peer pressure. And peer pressure means your peers, your friends, people that you hang out with, and the pressure that they put on you to do something. The pressure that you feel to do something, not because you wanted to do it yourself, but because everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is saying you should do it. Everyone else is expecting you to do it. And it's a lot of pressure for young people to be feeling. But the one thing I wanted, that I thought about, and someone told me this a long time, and it made a lot of sense, it's not just kids who feel peer pressure. We as adults, Muslim adults, men and women, fathers and mothers, we feel peer pressure also from our peers at work, our colleagues at work, our bosses, our teachers, people that are around us in the society, you feel a pressure to conform, to fit in, to, to do what other people do. Like in work, it's two months away, less than two months away from Christmas, they start having Christmas parties, they start planning them at bars or at hotels, and there's alcohol involved, and the expectation is you're gonna show up and you're gonna be there to network with the team, quote unquote. What do you do as a Muslim? You're not supposed to go. You don't want to go, but you feel this pressure. And it's a real pressure. Or they have secret Santas in the office where everyone agrees that they're going to give gifts to each other for, you know, a secret Santa to give a secret gift to, to somebody else. This is pressure. These are things that it's not only kids that are dealing with peer pressure and pressure to conform. It's adults. And the question is, are we going to conform? Are we going to fall to that pressure? Are we going to cave into that pressure or not? And it's just even just day to day, you know, praying, you know, making sure we stay, we stay on top of our salat. For this meeting today, for this salat al-jumat today, I had to decline a project status call with my boss 
and one of our vendors at work, and I had to say, I can't do it. This is a time that I have blocked on my schedule. I, you know, they scheduled this, but I can't do it. But there's still a pressure. You still feel this feeling like, oh man, I should have, you know, uh, what are they going to think of me? But we have to, we have to identify that and understand it. Again, that's pure pressure. You know, the whole issue of we don't watch what other people watch. We don't say and speak in a way that other people speak. And we don't talk about the things that other people talk about. There's a pressure to do that. But we have to be aware of that, that that, that is pressure. And that we're making a decision to avoid it. We're making a decision to stick to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the one we care about pleasing is not these people that are around us. Who, who knows how long they're going to be around? Who knows what they think? But we care about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and what He expects of us and what He's commanded, commanded us to do. And we know there's so many examples. Even now, the, the, as the days are getting shorter, and this weekend will be daylight savings time, if I'm not mistaken, Salat time is very difficult to squeeze into a busy schedule. Whether you're at work, whether you're at school, making sure you have your prayers on time takes a lot of deliberation, takes a lot of effort. effort. And there's a pressure to conform. There's a pressure to, to slip, to be neglectful, to, to compromise, to not be as mindful on the duties and the obligations that we have and on the things that we're supposed to, supposed to avoid. Right? And for us to be, to be not uh, uh, diligent. But the one thing we have to keep in mind, one thing I have to keep in mind, one thing we all have to keep in mind, is that environment, the environment that we live in has a big role. It plays a huge role. The people that you're around, the environment you're in, the ideas that people are talking about, the things that you're watching, it permeates, it gets into your mind and it changes your attitude or it can change your attitude. It affects your attitude. It affects your way of thinking. It affects your behavior. So we have to be very careful about our environment. And we're, we talk about the environment we're living in today, in this country, in this world. We're living in a very, very difficult environment. We have to be very vigilant and very guarded and be very careful about what we allow to get into our mind, right? There's an example of, you just imagine a frog, and a frog is in a pond, and the pond has all the things that a normal pond has. It has mud, it has fish in there, animals drink from it, there's dead fish in there, there there's pond scum, there's all, all this kind of things in a pond. It's just a normal pond. And you imagine you take this, this frog out, and you have this bottle of purified water. It's Fiji water from 10,000 miles away. The most pure water in the world you can think of. You pour this water on the frog, you clean the frog, but if you throw that frog back into the pond, what do you think is going to happen? He's going to be infected by his environment. He's going to be a dirty frog again. So paying attention to your environment is very, very, very critical, very important. And the example that we have to take when we, when we talk about pressure, when we talk about peer pressure, when we talk about the pressure to conform or to compromise, Go back and look at the Prophet in Mecca. The problems that we're dealing with, it's like this big compared to the problems that the Prophet had to deal with. The challenges that we may face, whether it's at work or at school or, or whatever it is, the, the little bit of pressure we may feel to conform, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it is so small. When you go back and look at the Prophet and the difficulty he had in Mecca, in that harsh environment, the environment that was harsh to Islam, that was harsh to the Muslims, that was harsh to the Dawah, it's very, very difficult. And if you look at not only the Prophet Sallallahu but his Sahaba, his companions who accepted Islam, and how difficult of an environment it was for them, and the bold stances he had to, they had to take. You know, look at, look at what the Prophet Sallallahu did. He came, was delivered a message, and as soon as he took this message, he started calling and inviting people to this message. And we know how hard that it was on him that people were rejecting him. His close family, his tribe, people were rejecting him, they were ignoring him, but it didn't stop there. Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to proclaim openly what he believes. There was a period of time where the Prophet was giving private da'wah to individuals, and then he was teaching them Islam at night. But then the order came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go out and proclaim, openly proclaim what, you, what you've been commanded, and then turn away from the mushrikeen. So at that point, the Prophet did something even different, which was to go out to society and challenge the society. And imagine the pressure that that was. All of a sudden, he was, he, was, he was challenging the people for worshiping these idols. And that was strange and very difficult for him to do. He was challenging the people who would just obey their tribes. And he was challenging the tribes and the leaders of the tribes, whether it was uh, Walid bin Mughira or Abu Jahal or Abu Lahab or whoever it was. A very strange stance to take and a very difficult stance to take. 
Not only that, he stood up and he started challenging through the Quran. Wait lil mutaffifin, and woe to those who cheapen the scales. He was challenging the people who had the influence and the power and the authority who were cheating people in the markets. That was a very strange stance for him to take. He was challenging the tradition of burying the female girls. If you know the story, the, 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 anytime someone would have, a, would have a boy, they would celebrate and rejoice and say, this is a great thing, we have a son, this is amazing. When a baby girl was born, their face would turn sad, they would frown, they would be, they would be scared, they would say, oh, this is just bad. And they would take that baby girl, dig a ditch, and throw her in there alive and put dirt on her until she died. That's what the, the Quran came to challenge. And the Prophet told some of the Sahaba, they would raise that message saying, for what crime was she killed? A very strange stance and a very difficult stance that he took. And then they were ridiculed because of it. They were boycotted because of it. We know the story of the persecution that happened to the Sahaba and the Prophet because of it. And the amazing thing is if you go back and you look at the Sira, if you look at the, the history of the Prophet you, you will realize that in Mecca, those Sahaba who joined the Prophet they were the ages of some of the young people that are in this room right now. Ali radiallahu anhu, he was eight years old when he became Muslim. Talha was also, I'm sorry, Ali and Zubair were eight years old. Talha radiallahu anhu, he was 11 years old when he became Muslim. Abdullah bin Masood was 14 years old when he became Muslim. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, he was 17. Uthman bin Affan, he was 20 years old. Musa was about 24 years old when he became Muslim. Umar bin Khattab was about 26. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was about in his early 30s, maybe 33, 34 when he became Muslim. So these are young people. And they took a very heavy message. And they took this, this pressure that, that they felt, but they still carried on the commandment. Didn't matter, what, didn't matter what challenges or obstacles they faced, they stuck to the commandments of Allah SWT. And even more than that, they challenged the society. And that's the mentality that the Prophet built in them. It was a, def, it was a, a, a defiant mentality. It was a questioning mentality. It was an inquisitive mentality. It was a challenging mentality to say, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what's right. And everything that everyone else is doing is what's wrong. So I'm not going to be influenced. I'm not going to be pressured. I'm not going to be affected by the society. It's the opposite. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to challenge it. And that's how you protect yourself. Because if you stay, you either, you either move or you get moved. You're either pushing or you get pushed. You're either influencing or you're getting influenced. Getting influenced. And the Prophet ﷺ taught the Sahaba, and this is the greatest gift we can give to our kids, and the greatest, the greatest thing that we can give to ourselves, which is to go back to Islam, to go back to what Allah SWT and His Prophet ﷺ taught us, and to build that same way of thinking, so that we measure and, and, and determine and, and judge everything by what Allah SWT and His Messenger have shown us and what they've taught us. Because we know that's the truth. We know that's the haq. We know that's, the, well, that's what's correct. That's what's right. So that's the gift we can give to our kids, that way of thinking, that mentality. And we have to remember, yes, the way we carry ourselves in this world, it will be viewed as strange. It was viewed as strange when the Prophet was first given this message. For 1400 years, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, the Muslims had a state. We had a government that implemented the rules of Islam. Islam was prevalent. The Islamic way of life was dominant. It was very easy, it was very easy, much more so compared to today, to carry on our obligations because we had this infrastructure, we had the apparatus, we had the environment, the environment to carry on our duties. We don't have that today. But that's where this hadith comes back into play. Islam will return as something strange, just like it began. So give, give glad tidings to the strangers. In these last few minutes of, the, of the, this, this khutbah, here's what I want to say. Coming back to this issue of moving or being moved, influencing or being influenced, affecting or being affected. When you built your aqidah, your belief in Islam, rationally, intellectually, soundly, where you know that there is one God, where you know that this book that he sent, this Quran, is the word of God. Not just because your parents tell you, not just because this is what you, you grew up believing, but because you've thought about it, and you've looked at it, and you've analyzed where could this book come from. It didn't come from the Prophet 
because he was he was illiterate. He didn't he, he didn't have a history of poetry. We can maybe do a different khutbah on that and how you can establish that the Quran is the word of God. Okay? But Islam tells you, don't take your religion just because your forefathers believed in it, just because your parents believed in it, and this is why I'm Muslim. No. Be convinced rationally. Because then when you're convinced, and when you believe in this firmly, and you have this, this solid understanding and solid belief, then it's very easy for you to move forward. And then the Prophet وسلم, just imagine, coming back to this issue of environment and peer pressure, going back to Mecca. When the Prophet وسلم, was in Mecca, he had he had kids as his followers. He had people who were slaves as his followers and companions. He had people who were being persecuted and tortured as his followers and companions. You could look at him and say, he has no influence. He has no power. He has no ability to affect anything. Even then, what did the Prophet tell tell people? He told the Quraysh, if you say this one word, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you will rule over the Arab and the Ajab. And someone could look at him and laugh, say, you're crazy. Na'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. They could look at him, at the Prophet, and say, you have some kids with you, you have some slaves following you, you have some people who were torturing, some of them were even killing, and you're telling us, if we follow your religion, we're going to rule over the world? But he built this mentality in the Sahaba, a victorious mentality, a challenging mentality, a bold mentality. So you don't look at your current situation, your current circumstances. You believe that we carry the right message, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help will come. He helps, no one can affect us, no one can take anything away from us, no one can hurt us or harm us, except by Allah's leave, by Allah's permission. So we don't care what anyone says or does. That's how you inoculate yourself. That's how you prevent and you, you, you save yourself from the pressure. And the last story I'm going to say before we end this khutbah, same exact situation in the Battle of the Ditch, Ghazat al-Khandaq. The Battle of the Ditch we all learn about as kids, or we teach our kids, or we may be reading about. The Prophet and the Sahaba were digging the ditch. And we know this is something they had never done before. This is a technique that came from a Sahabi who was from Persia. He said, this is what we saw. This is something we used to do. This is something I've seen before. Let's do this. Digging the ditch, digging the ditch, digging the ditch. The, 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 the Quraysh were coming. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Quraysh. All the different tribes also that allied with the Quraysh. They were coming. They're digging, digging, digging. They knew their time is up. They knew we're, we're outnumbered, we're overpowered, we have nothing. The only thing that's saving us from getting slaughtered is this ditch. So they're digging through this ditch and they hit a rock. And they're hitting the rock with their shovels and they're hitting the rock with their, with their picks and they can't break it. Imagine how scary of a situation that is. You have an army of, of, of various tribes, all of them allied to come and kill you. And there's this rock and the only thing separating you and them is this ditch. And you can't even dig this ditch now because there's a big rock in the way. And as the Sahaba were hitting the rocks, um, so hitting the rock with, their, with their, their, their tools, sparks were flying. And the Prophet said, out of this spark, I see Yemen being opened. And out of this spark, I see Persia being opened. And out of this spark, I see another place being opened. So in this extreme time of fear and terror and, and, and imminent doom, he's still showing the Sahaba, don't worry, this deen will be supreme. This deen will be victorious. Don't look at, the, at your situation, at your material situation, and think it's all over, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's in charge. So, we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. We beg him to establish our, our deen, to help the Muslims, to support the Muslims. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayuhu ladina aminu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alameen. Inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma baraka ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama baraka ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Inna ka hamidun majid. اللهم أنصر الإسلام المسلمين اللهم أنصر الإسلام المسلمين اللهم أنصر الإسلام المسلمين إن الصلاة. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran tafsir, and Sira are available at islampodcasts.com as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment, and let us know how we can grow in.